What was the branch? Uh, the army. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Here at Cabinet HR, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign on the refund platform. To learn more on how to become an earlier investor and the risk, go to refunder.com slash Cabinet HR. Our guest today is Alkadi. Alkadi, you're going to be great today. Hey, thank you for having me today. So let's talk about something like, you know, a kind of a softball question. What's something you do for fun? Snowboarding, drums, science fiction. I, I read a lot of science fiction, sometimes up until 4 a.m. My wife is kind of trying to pinch me. Like, hey, stop, turn off the light and whatnot. Um, snowboarding is my favorite way to actually completely relax. Sports, sports in general, surfing. So I have to say something first, like this is like first, right? You're the first, this first time I had a, like a husband and wife on the, on the podcast. <laughs> your wife went like a couple months ago. Oh. And I just say, I did, I impressed her so much. Like my husband coming on your podcast. You want to, if I already asked him first, it's probably, no, no, he's coming on this podcast. She was absolutely happy to be here and she shared it with me. And I'm like, sure. How can, how can I get there? She was like, okay. So she sold, she basically yeah. sold this experience to me. And I'm, I'm grateful to her for that. Um, how long have you been snowboarding? Like all your life? Or 25 years. 25 years. Okay. Yeah. Since I was 11. So pretty much my whole adult life. Yeah. So do you ever go skiing or is it straight snowboarding? Straight snowboarding. Okay. My whole life I've been snowboarding. Um, my my go-to joke is like, why do you need four different sticks if you can have one? They can't argue that logic. <laughs> now, have you ever done any skateboarding? Skateboarding, yes. Quite oh. a bit. When I was a teenager, mostly when I was maybe... 13 to 17, like that. Never was a big fan. Are they kind of the same things that one's on concrete, one's on snow? It's like the skill, like the like the turns and stuff, kind of the same, or it's totally different? I would say they're totally different. I would say surfing has more similarities with the snowboarding than skateboarding. Um, skateboarding is quite slow compared to snowboarding. You can You cannot really go fast. When I was skateboarding back in the days, when I was a teenager in, in the early 2000s, there were no proper skate parks in Moscow. So you couldn't go like ramp and whatnot, like proper skateboarding, like Tony Hawk does. So you, you all you have left is like curbs and some rails and things like that. So the speed is slow, the speed is low. So it's not, there is no excitement, you know, no, no exhilarating rush, like on a sport bike or on a snowboard. Um, and you get bruised all the time, like all the time, nonstop. I mean, I'm sure if you fall snowboard, it hurts, but it has to be different between concrete and snow when you fall. I would say that on snowboard, majority of your falls are not serious, but if you really hurt yourself, you do hurt yourself. Like, I mean, concussion and broken bones, like you don't really bruise yourself much on snowboard after the initial phase when your knees are blue and your butt is blue when, when you just start. On skateboarding, however, you, you're constantly bruised. No matter how good you are, how great you are, you constantly, like you push your level all the time and, um, the whole fun in skateboarding is performing a specific trick and you're pushing your trick level to the next one, to the next one. There is no leisure kind of skateboarding like you can get in on the snow. Concrete's concrete, you know. Yeah. A middle rail is a middle rail. <laughs> yes. A stair is a stair. A stair is a stair and, uh, you know, it hurts. <laughs> and it's like, and not like, you know, they're not having all this stuff. I'm sure they've had much on now, but they, they, back they just skateboard like they have nothing on, right? Just your skin and shorts. You still kind of, like, if you go snowboarding today, and I'm very grateful to see that change, everybody wears helmet. Uh, everybody is conscious about their head. 10, 15 years ago, it was not perceived as cool. But in skateboarding, it's still like that. Any kind of equipment, any kind of, I don't know, protective pads on your knees, and you're immediately not cool. Yeah, you're not when you when you're 14, it matters. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it does. So, what's like the most outlandish trick you've done as a snowboarder? Most what? Most outlandish trick you've done, hardest trick you've done as a snowboarder. Like any probably 720 Roto okay. 720. Back when I was riding, like like seriously riding, not anymore. No, and I, I was doing some basic stuff and then dislocated my shoulder just this year. And I mean, like basic, like 360. It's, it's nothing compl complicated, and. Um, I've realized I'm not 18 anymore, Jason, you know, <laughs> that, that, that was a revelation. How often do you get to go snowboarding now? 
uh, during the season, at least every week. Oh, at wow. least every week, yes. Well, where do you, have, you go to the same place Stevens every time? Pass. Okay. Yeah, I've got my Epic Pass, or what's the right name, and uh, I go there every Wednesday. I don't ride on, on week weekends, ever. Is there some type of, like, internal competition between snowboarders and skiers, like? Not as much as it was before. Okay. I wouldn't say it was a competition. I would say it was more like cat and the dog, like okay. like interspecies inner fight. Uh, I think it is still very much like that in many countries, like in Europe. I don't see any conflicts here in the U.S. I haven't I haven't heard any comments or anything like that. I haven't. Yeah, I wouldn't say there is no friction anymore. Is there a place like a, a bucket list place you want to go snowboarding at? Probably, you know, free riding in Chile. Like heli riding in Chile would be fantastic, just from what I've heard. Um, I've crossed a lot of these items from my bucket list back in the days. Like I've crossed, I've snowboarded across the whole Europe, Kamchatka, which is super wild. You get like a military uh, helicopter, you pay in an envelope and whatnot, and they kind of they drop you off in a no man's land and they say, "We never saw you. If something happens to you, that's on you." Uh, don't 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 expect any kind of rescue operations. This is all off books. No, it's like it adds, you know, a thrill to that. Yeah, you're like, I hope they're playing. I know they're playing, but oh, huh, this is a little too convincing. <laughs> that's, that's, they, they they look serious when they say it. You, you really like you don't want to mess up at that point. <laughs> so drums. How long have you playing the drums? Oh, just a year. Okay, so pretty new. Uh, just a year and drums. So why you pick that up for versus all the other instruments and hobbies you could do? I never played any music instruments in my life. And honestly, it felt like a like a caveat, like a gap. It, it didn't feel right that that I don't know how to play any music instruments. Um, I like to paint. I paint painted quite a lot. And then I've painted this one large picture. It's 60 by 60 inches. And I just couldn't pick up the brush anymore. I was like, ah, I, I just don't want, I don't know what do I want to paint. There was no... I, I couldn't start like this this painting was difficult and i was like but i still need some place for creativity in my life and was better time than now to pick up some some new stuff musical instrument in that and case. you take a lesson for someone you stop teaching yes, yourself yes nick is fantastic uh, so nick's drum lessons uh, he he's great if if you want i can share the link later you can share it with the your um your audience He's one of the best teachers. He was advised to me by my professor from a business school because he's also a drummer. And you have any favorite drummers through, through time? No, I'm I'm not ingrained in this community well enough to have favorite drummers. Uh, I like specific songs and I like specific drum lines, but uh, for the love of God, I I don't know what the name of a drummer is. I like Rage Against the Machine. Okay. And Excuse me for not knowing the name of the drummer. I actually don't know any names. Yeah, I just know the, I just know the band name too. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I see in my mind all the band members. I have no clue who the name is. I mean, I can say like these guys from Rage Against the Machine, yeah. uh, they're the face, but I will probably not be able to call the name of them. So what's been the hardest thing about becoming a drummer? Oh, it's a, it's a horrible experience, honestly. Like uh, I would use a very vivid language if I didn't care uh, enough for, for the people who listen to that. It is extremely humbling. Like you, when I just picked, picked it up, one of my friends who is a longtime drummer, he said, you, you're going to suck for the next six months for sure. It's going to be really bad. And God, he was right. Like some simple things that now seem minuscule would take you weeks to figure it out. Your, your, your limbs are connected to each other. So if you're left, arm wants to do something your left leg wants to, to start to follow the patterns and if you need to disconnect them it becomes a very difficult exercise and then your arms want to go in the same pattern and you need to disconnect your arms from each other and then your arms from your legs and it becomes a very much a coordination experience is you go one day like in the future like actually do like a live drum performance no a live audience or something no no, no. i do not have any aspirations to be a live artist in the same way i don't have aspirations to become a commercial pilot for example although i have a license um the the whole drumming experience for me is ex exclusively about embracing new skills and understanding and, and being able to play musical instruments because you kind of with a with osmosis you you get all this experience and you 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 understand it better you you feel it better 
in general, it's I think it's a very useful thing to do to be able to play drums, to be able to play any musical instruments. It's it, it develops your brain. Yeah, I just think as you get, we we have to learn new things all the time, right? Can't be stagnant. And learn something, right? Learn to code, learn to play the drums, learn exactly. learn something, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, new language. Do something to make your brain work. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, it's going to deteriorate very quickly. Yeah, I, I agree. So, how long have you had a commercial license? I don't have a commercial no. license. I've got a pilot license. Pilot license, okay. Yeah, so those uh, are two different things. Those are different things okay. uh, since 2020. Okay. I'm a COVID pilot. <laughs> I, I was really like, I was, you couldn't do anything. We we're living here on the Second Avenue. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do anything in Seattle. Everything is closed. Um, and I was working mad hours, like 10 hours a day, easily, six days a week, which is norm for me. But it was especially gruesome at that moment. I was deeply involved in IT. And uh, IT during COVID just, just exploded. The amount of work we had doubled overnight, basically. Um, I had to get out of house to go and do something. And I picked up the, the pilot idea. I wanted to be a pilot for a long time. And I was like, okay, now is the best time I will ever have a chance. And you still fly once in a while? Yeah, I still fly once in a while, especially when my friends come over. Right? I still fly. Yeah. Okay. So you have your own plane. You're like rent a plane out. How's that I work? rent a plane. Okay. Is that like crazy expensive or it's like pretty reasonable? Or I've heard the answers, it depends. It's roughly 200 bucks an hour. Okay. So I would say wake surfing is more expensive. Okay. When you rent a boat and you surf or like wakeboarding, I would say it's more expensive than flying a plane. And like, we want to rent a plane. Like, can you go like right now, call and say, I want to rent a plane in two hours. Or you have to like give them like a week notice. Week, two weeks. They okay. have their own internal system that, that you go in online and book it. And like really good planes and some fresh planes that are, that are in demand could be booked out for like a month in advance. Uh, some older planes could be available in a week or so. And, um, and you use the same people all the time. Same what? You use the same people all the time. People? The, the same plane, the same um, company. Oh, the same company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Always okay. the same company for sure. The same. Well, the school where I got my license, that's where I ran my plane from. Like when you get a plane, like you have to like give me your flight plan. Like say, I'm, I want to fly from here to whatever place. Or you, or this. Not necessarily. Okay. If if you decide to fly from here to say Oregon, it's a good idea to file your flight plan yeah. simply because yeah, I would think so, yeah. somebody would track you. you. You would be handed off from the airport to the uh, controller yeah. and, and so on and so forth. It's going to be, you're going to be safer. Uh, however, you are not required under visual flight rules to to file a plan. And I only I only fly visual. Uh, I don't fly instruments. So I don't fly when the weather is bad, for example. Uh, again, something, in my opinion, unnecessary for a hobby. And I don't plan to make it, uh, I, I don't have to get anywhere on the plane. I don't plan to make it a commercial thing for me. So no, not necessarily. And usually if you just fly around, say Mount Rainier, or you get out of Renton and fly next to the Space Needle and back to Renton, there is no necessity to file anything. You're always in vicinity of a tower or something like that. So there is always a fallback plan if something goes weird. All right. And do you, do you, do you still do rock climbing? Yes. I Well, probably rock climbing was my favorite sport of all. The best combination of fitness and, and excitement, the best combination of muscle work and mind work. And I completely forgo it after COVID. For a long time, you couldn't do it at all, and then for um, for some time, for some time, you can only do it in the mask. And your when 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 you do something as intense as rock climbing in a mask, it, it's it's very tough. And then I just couldn't find a really strong coach with whom I could stick for a long time. Um, all the coaches that are readily available here, uh, they were the ones to ask me, oh, you did this and that. Why? I'm like, because of like, this is easier way to climb. They're like, oh, cool. I'm going to use it next time. I'm like, okay, who's the like, coach here? You, what, yeah, like you're the coach. What's going on here? Yeah. Pretty much. And then um, a few coaches that really impressed me, they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to work here one day a month when we want to, but we are not available. Like, you cannot book us like, you know, every Tuesday you go there. And for rock climbing to be efficient, you want to do it at least twice a week. Better yet, if you can do three times a week. And when you don't have a good coach, I I tend to get, I don't want to say lazy. I tend to to kind of feel that I, I worked out enough today. Mm -hmm. And my coach, back, the one that, that actually trained me back in the days, 
he was the one to be like, okay, Arkady, okay, let's do two more laps and then you can go home. And uh, that, that's how you actually build up the muscle. Like, you know, Jackie Chan said, I I push up until it hurts and then five times more. Yeah. That, that's the idea yeah. there. So yeah. this five... Yeah, they don't count until you've done like 20 or 30 already. Yeah. This, this five times more is something that doesn't happen without a coach. When I do rock climbing, I tend to find 355 reasons why I'm I'm okay for now. I'm <laughs> yes. just going to push it next time. Yes, of course. So it's like with rock climbing, it's like a lot of a lot of muscle memory, right? Doing the same thing over and over again. In general, yes. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's majority of what you do is squats, because <laughs> you only use hands to kind of hold off to the wall. You don't you don't pull yourself up. If you do that, then, then you're doing something wrong. So majority of what you do is you, you pull your legs up and you do the squat. Pull your legs up and do the squat. Okay. That's that's the idea. Um you can get a lot of fun by finding new routes, some some kind of overhanging route, something that goes around the corner. There are ways to get to make this entertaining. And sometimes it is indeed more of a mind exercise than muscle exercise. Sometimes it is exclusively about uh, overcoming your fear. This easy example is you need to make a dynamic movement. We kind of need to jump from one point to the next one. And where are you going to hold off? It's a big, big... Uh, handhold like you can you can easily hold on to that but you have at some point you have to let everything go like all your hands all, all your feet and this feels dangerous you kind of jump especially if it's like in the middle of the wall say 12 feet high and then you have to jump from one point to another you look huh. like i've never jumped this far in my life before what makes you think i can do it now but Pretty you much. do it you do it and then you do it and you're like oh oh it was possible and it builds confidence it's, it's a good one do you have any like a um bucket list rock climbing places you want to go to no no, no. i all, only ever climbed in the gym never okay. climbed outside never wanted to do it outside never wanted to do yeah. it outside uh to me it's more of a of a fit like i hate how boring fitness is like yeah. i i cannot go to the gym I like yeah. i, I want to shoot myself in the head when i do that so to me it was always an entertaining way to gain muscle mass and to, to be in shape in general okay so moving on next can you talk about a transformer organization, right? Like, how does that happen? Like, how do you even convince the organization they need to be transformed? Um, I never had to convince anyone to to be transformed. I was always approached by people to be transformed. Um, and it's usually shareholders who see that the top management is not performing according to, to the expectations that usually the top management lays out lays out for themselves. So People would say, okay, we're going to reach specific revenue targets and they don't reach it once, twice, three times. That's when shareholders start to think about maybe we need a new CEO. And uh, the first time I was invited by um, by an HR, by headhunters basically, who introduced me to the shareholders, I did the restructuring and then the same shareholders asked me to do it again. And so those are the two times I did the actual hardcore restructuring when you go in, clean the house and build it. And you have to you have convinced them to go with your plan, or you just are just not it. not necessarily convince them, but more so you go in, you do the initial assessment of the company, of the industry it operates in, of the team that runs the company. And then you suggest usually it would be an action plan of what you would like to change, how would you like to update it? And that's when um and that's when you have the discussion with the shareholders and they either approve the plan or they have some edits to the plan. Um, usually they approve your strategy. Uh, very rarely they would try to add something add, add something serious there, maybe a maybe minor edit or something like this. And then you go, you, you, have a defined, you have a defined kind of guidelines. Within these guidelines, you draft up a strategy. Then you go and approve this final strategy and then you just go and execute the strategy. So that's how the process works. And what's the process for deciding the time to make the transformation? Like, how do you say this should happen in six months, two months, a year? How do you decide that? I don't think there is a cookie cutter answer to this question. Usually it's more so um, what are the targets that shareholders want to achieve with this specific company and what do they need in what time? So if shareholders are happy to wait for the next five years, you can you, it can be a gradual transformation if they need the results in 12 months then you then you need to be very rapid with these things so 
it depends on what their expectations are. Okay. So next, can you talk about the points of companies making data uh, driven decisions and the points of companies being data centric, so to speak? Sure. Um, the This is such a hyped term these days, like data centric, data driven. Everybody is data driven to some what degree. Um, and it can stem from everything like an easy example would be the conversions on your website or conversions on your social media. How many people like your content? How What's the percentage? How can you improve that percentage? That's that's very simple and, and uh, I would say simplistic application of data-driven decision-making. That's obvious to everybody. A little bit more complex uh, thing would be to monitor the happiness of your employees. You would be surprised how small of a percentage of companies actually do monitor the satisfaction of their employees in a in a real way not just some fake metrics for 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 the street but in the real way this can drive a lot of decisions in terms of how you retain your talent how you acquire new talent how do you make sure that people do not sit in the same place and do not get stagnated they don't feel you know that the life kind of passes them by um, this this could be a little bit more complex and requires a little bit more monitoring surveys and things like that. Um, and it can go all the way down to actually actually serious data driven models when you're talking about some specific meta metrics. So you don't look at metrics, but you look at the dynamics of a group of metrics and how they correspond to each other. These are very rare. I've seen this maybe once in my life, but usually these teams really know what they do. So change the subjects. You 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 came to the United States from Russia a few years ago, right? Yeah. Like how long? How, how many years have you been here? Since February 2020. So when you moved to America, what's like something that like shocked you about America? Like you weren't expecting, like some kind of some like a culture shock. Like you knew we did in America. Like okay, I see it now. It's like totally like kind of blew your mind, so to speak, that you weren't expecting. police more than anything else like we had this very funny moment when we first uh, had to buy some pills in the pharmacy and they gave us these yellow bottles and you only see it in the movies before because in russia you just buy pills in a blister like yeah well you would buy claritin or or i don't know allegra some just just a carton package and they gave you this kind of orange thing this was fun but the real culture shock was police because and i told this to vlada maybe like a year ago or so, we heard the the sirens. And I was like, look, whenever you, you live in Russia and you hear the sirens, you're like, oh shit, something's going down. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're in the US and you hear sirens, you're like, oh, something's going to be figured out now. Uh, the, the history of Russian police has been for a very long time, a more so an oppressive system than the protection system, uh, especially through Soviet Union period. It got better in, in modern Russia, but in Soviet Union, Police was something that is mainly protecting the state from the people who live in that state. In the U.S., it's very different. I I know all the problems that exist with the American police, sure. But I'm telling you, in in the U.S., the main thing for police is to protect you, first and foremost, and then figure out everything else. I mean, and and it goes from very tiny things like uh, we've been in a car accident, and the first thing the policeman said when he came was, could you please step to the side of the road so nobody hits you? The first thing the Russian policeman would say, like, oh, what a dumb idea. How could you crash your car like that? <laughs> Are you blind or something? It would be immediately jumping to ju- to judging. Yeah, that's crazy. So why why Seattle? All the seasons in the United States go to, why the Seattle area? Vlada selected uh, a town, a city. I the the agreement was I would select a country and she selects a city. So uh, I think she would be better positioned to answer that. In general, we like the total atmosphere of the town, the, the vibe of the of, of Seattle. It's extremely productive and it's not aggressive at the same time. This is weird compared to like if you go Moscow, London, New York. They're all productive, but they're also very aggressive. Like, look at how people drive in New York, for example. Very or how they walk across the street, for that matter. Sure, or how that... they walk by you, for that matter. <laughs> exactly. That that reminds me a lot of Moscow, but um, Seattle is not like that. Yeah. 
So I post some things from your from some posts you don't you don't link them recently. So you did a post on something called graphene. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, sure. Like seen like I've, I've seen like this this post like this super mineral kind of up. What is graphene? And oh, it's it's basically carbon that is done in a in a flat atomic two D layer, two dimensional layer. So you, you talk about diamond or a graphite pencil. It's all carbon. It's basically all carbon, just a different pressure. So the, the beauty of graphene is that it's a two-dimensional material made out of carbon. So instead of a three-dimensional... So, so it's like a natural made... No, no, it's not natural made whatsoever. The The invention of... The, so the invention of graphene was very funny. They, um, the researchers, they actually got the Nobel Prize for that, uh, if I recall correctly. The The researchers had, had a layer of graphite and um, they had a... What's the board? Not the masking tape. Duct tape. They they had a duct tape on it, and they peeled it off, and they saw a thin layer of of, of material on it, and they started researching that. That's how they came onto this. So the beauty is that it, it's not it's not natural at all. It's like as artificial as it gets. And the beauty is that this two dimensional material has superior properties. It's much harder than steel. It's much lighter. So in theory, if you can build a tube made out of a single atom layer of uh, graphene. It's called nanotubes. And uh, you can build extremely strong structures. It's all fine and dandy unless you realize that, uh, until you realize that the, these tubes are maybe like an inch long is the longest by far that has ever been built. So, so it's not one practical those, yet. It's one of those things easier said than done so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You think we'll so. get to where we actually use it as an everyday, as an everyday tool? I don't know about everyday tool. I think eventually we will get there. Whether you and I will see that or not, that's a question. Um, I think it will be very specific uh, military and aerospace usage first, and then maybe gradually it will kind of disseminate in our lives and trickle down to our daily usage. But I don't see a lot of, outside of specialized equipment, I don't see a lot of use cases for super light, super strong material in our daily lives. We don't need it. Okay. So I'm pretty sure you don't know this answer to this question, but like you just said, these scientists you know, basically got this by luck, right? How many, how much science is actually found by luck, right? I'm sure scientists do their work, all that kind of stuff, but how often is like this, like just pure luck and like, you know. I, I don't know an answer to this question. Yeah. What's, what's the percentage of science discovered by luck? No idea. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of our discoveries as a civilization in general has been something random has been something like you do realize that that wine was not designed to be wine somebody just drank a spoiled grape juice and was like oh, okay that's I'm, I'm not dead and i feel funky Man, I, 30 minutes later i feel like i feel kind of good right now <laughs> exactly uh the, the invention of bread was also something really weird so they used to take grains and mix it with water and kind of dump it into the hole in the ground and that would be some kind of a porridge that they would eat and there were a couple of very hot days, at least the, 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 the this official story goes, a couple of hot days and kind of had a crust. And they're like, ooh, what if we take this and put it on fire? Is it going to be as good as this crust that was there because of the sun? A lot of our research is random. A lot of our inventions are random. Um, the story that I really love is Maxwell's equation. That's all electrodynamic stuff. So he created his equations in his original form, not, not in the way that we know it with all the div divergence and, and everything, but he created these equations in his original form. And he was like, it's missing something. And he, he added an element to an equation simply from the side of mathematical beauty. And it turned out that this was the full complete equation and it actually worked. And this, his prediction was just a hunch driven by mathematical aesthetics more than anything else. And now look at this, 50% of our world GDP is thanks to electromagnetic um, equations of Maxwell. I don't know how often this happens, right? Like, of course, like the guy just said, he was like, we're all no scientist. So he took his findings and people did a peer review and did, you know, okay. But how many people are there, like, they're not like really, we're all no scientists, they're not even scientists at all. And they're messing around with different things. And they actually figure something out. Awesome, but like, yeah, I'm just Jason Cavanis. There's no way this is right. And just throw it away, right? I'm sure that happens more than we think. I think it happened more than than we would expect, say, 100 years ago or so. 
majority of the low hanging fruits, at least in physics, the one field that I can talk in great detail about, I don't know, for example, what's the case with biology. I'm pretty sure that there are lots of revelations that could be done uh, by people who are bystanders. Maybe I'm wrong. But for physics, that is definitely the case when I do not I would not expect a lot of random people just barging into this field and then getting some something done without prior without prior formal education there. So with physics, like who's like when did physics actually begin? Like who's like the father of physics? Newton. Okay. Of course. Like the, the he's the He's the author of calculus. He's the author of all the modern, all the modern physics. I would say. So physics is that's what we're talking about, like stuff like a uh, the Big Bang theory, dark matter, mm -hmm. all the kind of things, including this as well. Your TV is mm -hmm. physics. Uh, the ability to broadcast this interview on a global scale is all physics enabled. So your your all of your devices is quantum mechanics so physics has to be like perfectly balanced right it can't be off a little bit and then everything goes to shit correct yes like of course there are always margins mm -hmm. especially when you deal with real life applications you you can have margins in how these devices work and you can have margins in how perfectly everything is aligned your car would have a lot of margins built into it built for mm -hmm. robustness uh, when we talk about theoretical physics, yeah, one simple mistake in calculations would completely throw you off your game and you would not find why it doesn't work anymore. Is there like something in physics that you think is out there hasn't just been discovered? Like, like oh, do you think there's actually wormholes or potential for time travel? Absolutely, yes. I mean, the whole physics is the history of how they've been disproved. We had this professor of atomic physics back in the days, probably one of the best professors I've ever had. Definitely the best physics professor I've ever had. Uh, so. He, the first maybe month or two, he was teaching us the history of atomic physics. And he said, so everybody found protons, neutrons, and electrons, and everybody was happy until some dumb person found quarks. And everybody's like, gosh, we just figured it out. Why do you need to make it more complicated? And then he said, okay, we have two quarks. Let's call it up and down. And everything we know is comprised out of that. A couple of years later, another guy comes up and say, hey, actually, there is another pair of quarks. And then another guy comes up and there is another pair of quarks. And like physics is constantly rewriting itself. The whole idea of scientific method, you, you can kind of write a cycle. You have a hypothesis, something works like that. Then you do an experiment to prove or disprove your theory. You collect the data and you update your hypothesis based on that data. You, you make some conclusions and you, you update your hypothesis and then the cycle repeats itself again. So the whole idea is that you constantly break the laws of what is, what, what is real and what is not. There is old meme about that. Uh, you break the laws of society, you go to jail. You break the laws of religion, you go to hell. You break the law of physics, you go to Sweden and get your Nobel Prize. <laughs> That's funny. So do you think we found like the smallest thing out there? Or, or is it possible to like, find something so small we can't even see it? But we can prove it's there. There is a physical limit uh, to how small a thing can be. Linearly, um, Planck's constant, uh, the Planck's size. You cannot have anything smaller than that would not have any physical sense. So quarks are still much larger than that. So maybe there is something. Um, I I don't think that's that's really the main question. The, the main question right now is how to unify weak and strong uh, nuclear um, electromagnetics and gravity together into one model. The, the whole unification theory that we've been struggling with, how to basically weak, strong, and elect electromagnetic, you can all wrap up together in, in so-called standard model, was how do we in incorporate gravity into that? That has been the biggest problem. Everything else seems to work fine unless you start dealing with gravity. I, I would say gravity and the nature of time are the largest theoretical physics, physics problems of our universe in general. Of maybe not universe, sorry. Of where we are right now as a civilization. Do you think there's other, other civilizations out there? I want to believe. Let me put it this way. Um, are we going to encounter them or not? That's a whole different question. 
it just seems very unlikely that we're the only ones. Especially with the thing James Webb discovers all these galaxies every day with all these planets potentially is this it's like what how many billions of stars in our galaxy yeah. galaxy billions and how many galaxies are there are billions so it's billions and billions and at least as many planets i would argue there are probably trillions of billions of planets uh you know in in the observable universe and we don't actually know how larger it is than the observable universe so it's just very very unlikely that we're the only um civilization that has emerged extremely yeah. unlikely um however space is vast and the uh, traveling through space without discovering wormholes or some other science fiction concepts or maybe uploading your consciousness and sending your consciousness as a data packet is very difficult and even if you can figure out the as fast as light travel you're still dealing with the problem that the space is extremely huge. Like our the closest star to our star system is four light years. So even if you travel at the speed of light, you have to spend four years traveling from point A to point B. So if, if superluminal travel is not possible and everything we know about physics says it is not, um, and it has to deal with causality, so it goes into deeper philosophical questions rather than just physics and then formulas um then the chance of, of seeing another civilization is extremely small simply because how large space is you make a good point a lot of people think like they look at the night sky if they're like in the country see all these stars close like space is actually much of darkness and blackness they ain't like the stars like right next to each other right they're like far far apart right stars are very far from each other yes light years from each other and um it seems all nice from our corner of the galaxy, but I think when you're in space and when you're between star systems, it could be very devastating for your psyche. So Elon Musk comes to you and says, hey, I want you to be in the first flight to Mars. You saying yes or no? Knowing it's going to be, you could probably go at least two years, time away from family, all the dangers and all that kind of stuff. I'll probably say yes, simply because um, I like new challenges and adventures. I know for sure my wife would be okay with that. Um, my concerns would be more so what happens right now with my own business and with all the things that I do. What happens while I'm away for the next two years? Can I put it on hold? Can, can I pause it? So if it happens in the next, if it happens today, it would be challenging. If it happens in half a year from now, it would be much easier. If it happens in two years from now, I'm like, okay, sign me up. I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. So it's it's um, it has more to do. By the way, yeah, nobody's gonna let me go to Mars tomorrow. They need proper physical conditioning yeah. and all of that stuff. So yeah. you need to be extremely fit physically and mentally to go on any any deep space mission, let alone Mars. Um, you need to be compatible with your peers. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the most important one right there. You're going to be these random few, two years. You got to be compatible in some kind of way. I think in every possible way, yeah. including probably sexual way, you probably have to have some people with whom you're compatible sexually because how are you going to survive there for two or three years yeah. without human touch? Yeah, good point. So what's what's a problem you think people who do physics now should be working on? To me, the most interesting part of physics would be fusion. Um, there are several things. Okay, if we talk about, and I will lay them up in the at the scale of plausibility. I would say fusion is something that is plausible, not feasible. It's possible to be done. Um, maybe it's not ongoing joke about fusion. It's always 20 years away. It was 20 years away in the 60s, and it's still 20 years away from now. Maybe it's 15 years away. There is still a lot of issues with figuring it out properly. Then the next very, very interesting thing, and I would say that fusion is the holy grail of physics, because once you figure out fusion, you have almost zero cost, limitless energy that is as green as it gets, that has no downsides such as nuclear fission has. And it is going to change how we live as society. Because if you have access to limitless energy, you actually have access to limitless production. You start moving to the post-material civilization. 
where it doesn't really matter anymore who who has a Ferrari and who has a Golf. I don't know, whatever. 1997 Honda Civic. Uh, I love Honda Civic, by the way. I used to ride it for many years. So, um, Fusion. The next thing that is dear to my heart would be nano assembly. So, if we can figure out how to disassemble anything into raw proton, pr protons, neutrons, and electrons and assemble into it, it back into anything else, which is again theoretically possible, just requires an enormous amount of energy. That's why fusion is is really important. Then you will essentially have a machine where you can throw a glass of uh, you can throw a glass into it, or you can throw a bottle of water and get a diamond or a burger or a shoe, whatever you want, as long as the number of proteins and uh, protons, neutrons and electrons are enough. You can throw in a piece of dirt and get out a bullet. Like it doesn't you can get built, you can build anything you want, basically. So if those two things happen, we are going to essentially become post-material society, which is going to redefine how we live, how we, what are the major, the whole value system of our society will be changed. The capitalism will no longer exist and we'll have to figure out a way to live in a new world where people are not starving, you know, so on and so forth. Sorry, the last one here would be warp engines and the uh, ability to fold space-time. Uh, it's theoretically, it has been proven theoretically possible and even, you know, without the necessity to have unlimited energy, but it's still very, very far from practical applications. Yeah, that's some nice stuff. Um, so science fiction, any like, like favorite science fiction books or TV shows or movies? 100% Neuromancer by Gibson, okay. number one. Um, the only book I believe who won Hugo Nebula and Philip Dick Awards, all three major science fiction awards, the only book in history that actually did oh, it. Wow. And um, one of the best books by Gibson, in my in my own opinion. This is definitely my favorite book. I think it's a fantastic piece of literature. I think it's going to be classics. like, And I mean classics, like Shakespeare. It's the way he wrote it, the way the, the the language, everything is fantastic. The story, all of these things. And he wrote it back in the 80s and predicted the modern world pretty much pretty much exactly. And of course, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay. Yeah, I think it's scary how back in the day, I think 60s Star Trek pretty much predicted us now, like the, the flip phone, the TV screen, the microwaves, so like, yeah. So I wonder what 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 we're what's on TV now is it, that's gonna come true like 20, 30 years, you know. A lot of stuff that they predicted never happened. We don't have flying cars. Yeah. We don't have artificial limbs that are really are like properly integrated mm -hmm. in our life. Sure, they work, but like you cannot you cannot uh, feel, you cannot touch as as well as you could with your actual arm, for example. Um, lots of things haven't materialized yet, but they will at some point. So what got you interested in the field of physics? What do you do to that? When I went back when I was 17. To me, physics was always about understanding the world around us better than, than, than we know already. It was an ability to to add a new lens to your perception of the world. For example, if you realize that everything around us and you yourself and me, myself, are just emptiness rearranged, 99% of all the space within an, a given atom is emptiness. So a tiny proton and a tiny electron flying very far from it, and it's 99% between us, it's empty. So this table is emptiness, this glass is emptiness, you are manifestation of emptiness and so on and so forth. Isn't it fascinating to understand that the world is empty at its core and like all the Buddhists were right from day one? That's insane, for sure. Wow. And then actually you probably get the philosophy people in there too discussing all the philosophy aspects about it. Uh, yes, yes. I used to run a philosophy club. Uh, Who knew physics and philosophy were together? I would never same guess stuff. that. Um, there is this ongoing joke that biology is just applied chemistry, Chemistry is just applied physics. Physics is just applied math. Math is just applied philosophy. And philosophy is just a byproduct of misunderstanding. That makes a lot of sense. So what makes someone... Um, what, what, what do you call someone who studies physics? 
like does a physics person or like is a term for it? physicist physicist okay physicist what makes someone a good physicist that's a loaded question uh, i hope i'm not going to make any enemies answering that there should be no bias in whatever research you do and whenever you start your research you should not be going there trying to prove you're right lots of people do that lots of people get burned by that lots of really smart people are bad scientists because they don't follow the main principle of not being biased also very famous scientists are like that as well so that's number one you should not be biased you should be proving or disproving a theory your own as well as you would do with the, you know with the next guy you should have an intuition in terms of um, where to take your research and there are people who would be looking at a whiteboard for days and not see any path forward not not a solution just a path forward and there would be people who would instinctively intuitively see it in like a minute like oh okay what if, what if we do this uh, thing to mathematics what what if we change this formula to something else and what if we take an integral over this space and just move on and they find the path forward so you should be unbiased you should have intuition obviously you should be trained you should be well trained in your field but i've seen lots of people who are well trained me included i'm, I'm never going to be a great scientist myself in order to be a physicist it's just matter get a bachelor's degree master's phd like what makes someone how can someone say I'm a physicist? Have a certain level of education. Masters in science, I think, is masters. enough. Okay. Uh, but then again, like I've got masters in physics. Am I a scientist? No. no. Can I say that I can be a strong scientist? Like honestly, honest to God, no, I don't think so. For for instance, I honestly think that I lack that that scientific intuition. I have life intuition, business intuition. Um, from everything I understand about the works about in, how intuition works is your experience that's um, digested by your subconscious mechanisms. And then you get answers like out of nowhere, actually it just emerges from your subconscious. I don't think I have that level of intuition when it comes to physics. I do when it comes to business. I do when it comes to relationship. I do not when it comes to physics. So I knew he's the father of physics, right? Who? Newton. Newton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he lived back in the 1500s, 1600s? 1600. If he 1600s. came back to life today, would he say, hey, people who do physics, y'all made like great strides? Or would he be like, I can't believe you haven't figured this one thing out yet? I think he would be amazed with what we have achieved. Absolutely. Like he would be, he would be mesmerized by, by the amount of what has been achieved. Honestly, I think we don't even need to go that far even if we take einstein and, and uh, put him in the modern electric vehicle uh, and uh, einstein died relatively not so long ago he wouldn't be for example mesmerized by a plane but if you put newton into a commercial airliner or a private jet it would blow his mind yeah. or if you give him an That'd iphone be overwhelming, huh? if you give iphone to einstein i'm pretty sure he'd be like what's that and like you can access Wikipedia, you can access any bit of human knowledge just on your palm. That would be something, in my opinion, absolutely mind-boggling for him. Let's suppose there's like a early physicist out there, like maybe they're in college by studying. What advice you have them for like either like become a better physicist or, or doing as a career? Honestly, not in a place to give advice to become a better physicist because uh, I am not. Although I've got masters in science, so. Um, what I would give to an advice that I would give to any who anyone who goes into college is follow your passion, follow your heart, and they will lead you to the right place. They will lead you to the biggest potential of your self-actualization in general, whether you study physics, ancient history, or uh, AI, just just follow what you feel is right. This will make you a uniquely positioned person. So around the world is like the where I'm looking at. Like, is the process for science the same? Like, a peer review article in the United States has the same method of doing a peer review article, like, we'll say, Saudi Arabia, or the, is all the science stuff the same, all the methods are the same, the standards are the same, are they different? Principles would be the same. The, the idea would be the same. You submit a paper, other people from the field review it and uh, provide their comments on that. Um, 
it will be different in terms of like what exactly is done by every single person. Not within the same lab in the U.S., it will be different peer reviews. But the process, the general vision is the same. Does a certain country or a certain part of the world produce more scientists, or they pretty much the U.S. U.S. produces more? Why? Why do you think that is? This so we put more money into science or something like that, or? I think U.S. recognizes the the importance of technology and has always recognized the importance of technology. And after World War II, um, only doubled down on that as the core civilizational engine. The there is a guy called Václav Smilkai, old distinguished professor uh, called Václav Smil. He says, and I fully agree with him that. Our civilizations are defined by the technologies that we use more than anything else. Um, the steam engine and the internal combustion engine, now we live in electricity, now internet. Now we are going to live in the world of uh, where AI is more and more present. By the way, I don't think we need a sentient AI for AI to have a huge impact on our world. Uh, like we, we don't need thinking machines and self-sentient machines that, that feel as a person for AI to completely change the way we live our lives. Uh, there is a lot to be afraid of as is. There is a lot of to be hopeful for as is. We don't need uh, uh, a Skynet uh, or a Matrix uh, architect. Well, at least you know how to bring for if Skynet comes. Well, be nice to your curry coffee machine. Maybe she will put a word for you. I know, right? Yeah, everything's connected. So let's talk about human challenges for a minute. Like, from my point of view, like the tech has always got a lot better. Of course, we start with, to me, fire off tech, the, the wheel, then, you know, airplanes, all the tech now. But has human challenges actually got better since the beginning of time? Or are we still based the same level of smartness? You just be able to build better stuff. Okay. So here's my take on that. The, <clears throat> and this is probably going to be more contrarian than, than some other things. Um, First and foremost, I think that human experience is all about your perception of the reality. Somebody in your position would feel miserable. Somebody in your position would feel absolutely happy. Uh, and you feel as you, you just live your life and there is, it's not an extreme happiness. It's not extreme misery in any way. Uh, somebody who would be put in a mansion of a Hollywood star would feel absolutely happy. And that the same Hollywood star could commit suicide in the same mansion two days after. The, the the whole thing about like is humanity experience better than it was before human experience is by definition subjective and it's by definition the, the byproduct of external circumstances of your and your perception of that so i don't think anything technology religion um philosophy ideology anything can really profoundly change the human experience from the viewpoint of that we always, as humans, want more. We always are seeking something else. We're always craving for something. On all the seven deadly sins or whatever philosophical, religious school you choose to select, we'll say the same thing. So subjectively, I think it's the same. Uh, whether we lived in a cave, in a castle, or now we live in a high-rise, subjectively, we will always be unhappy that Mary didn't look at me this, this, this way that I wanted her to look at me. Or maybe Joe said something to my boss about me that, that now puts me in a bad light. Always, we'll always find things to be unhappy about. Um, objectively, we we just see the life expectancy, child mortality rate, and the amount of disease we can conquer. AIDS is not a deadly disease. It was it was in the 80s, 40 years ago. It was, it was a death the sentence. deadly disease. It was the deadly disease. Yeah. Now it's cancer, and even cancer is going away with targeted ter therapy, with gene remanufacturing, with ter targeted proteins and T cells. Cancer will be along. Cancer would not. Cancer is already not a deadly sentence. Many many forms of cancer is not a death sentence anymore. Look at breast cancer. Um, there is still like glioblastoma, like like brain cancer that's very aggressive. There are still things that are deadly and unfortunate. And there are still things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But man, people used not to live to this age. <laughs> now they do. Um, life expectancy grows. Child mortality goes down. Uh, the amount of people killed in violent, uh, well, up until a couple of years ago, in violent um, conflicts go down. 
I believe humanity has more obese people than it has starving people these days. So objectively, we are better off as species in terms of like, if we look at humans as pets, are we fat? Do we sleep well? Blah, blah, blah. We are better off. Medicine yeah. is better. Food is better. Everything is definitely better. The, the world is interconnected. I can fly anywhere on this globe and I'll be there like 20 hours tops yeah. if we choose some obscure destination. This is insane. 200 years ago, that would be unimaginable. No, they, there's nothing 20 hours away from here. This is our, my world right here. There's a little village. Exactly. Exactly. So objectively, I think we're so much better off. Subjectively, people will always find something to suffer about. This hue of pink is not pink enough. This gold doesn't shine as, as, as it mm -hmm. used to shine. My iPhone is not fast enough. Or exactly. I one time I was on a plane traveling somewhere, and this guy, I mean, he had a shit fit because the interview didn't work, and the waitress was and not the waitress. The stewardess said, "Sir, can you wait a second? You know, it has to go to space and come back. You know, and of course, you felt really dumb then, right? I mean, like slow Wi-Fi on the on the airplane is being like, I think it's the poster child of first world problems. Yeah. And then there are people who would moan about that. Yeah. There are people who would be unhappy about slow Wi-Fi on the plane. I'm like, get out of here. Like five years ago, it was impossible. Yeah. It's crazy what people do or don't do. And, and you know, we, we are adaptive species, right? We will um, we will take everything that's good for granted very fast. And we will be unhappy if something doesn't go our, our way very fast. Yes, absolutely. That's always going to be the case. In post-material society, when you can get yourself a hundred thousand square feet house uh, on the Malibu beach, uh, in built in two days by nano assemblers, yeah. uh, you will be bored because this marble is not just doesn't feel like it used to feel. You know exactly right. I walk on it in the morning and it's just not not warm enough or not cold enough. People will always find what's something to mourn about. Yes, yeah, insane. Like the different, like I say, compares like you know, like a poor person in the United States is a different level of poor from someone like in, I like would we'll say, Ethiopia, or you know, another country. You know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's very true. And there are people in Bangladesh who live in slums as they live in the '80s. For them, nothing changed. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people. Being in the army, you, you get um, see a lot of people in the world how they really live. Like, you know, we've seen people like you know, Afghanistan sleep on dirt floors. And like that's like luxury for them to have a roof of their head is luxury, right? They don't care about the dirt floor. They just because they have something on their head, you know. Oh, you don't get wet during the rain and the night. Animals will not bite a piece of your food when you're asleep. That's that's luxury for them. And that's I think people in general do not have appreciation for how well off the yeah. majority of us are compared to what was here 200 years ago. Like, I mean. When was the hygiene by a surgeon invented? I mean, I think believe I believe it's between first and second world war. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't so like a hundred years yeah. ago. Yeah. Before that, they would just they would just okay. Let me, uh, me so on this Jason, let me so on Tom, same knife, same everything. Same exactly, yeah. Exactly. Same, same dirty arms, and like nobody cared about that. I'm I honestly think we're so much better off thanks to technology, thanks to scientific method. This whole way of thinking uh, is I mean, think about, you know, electricity is not that long ago, you know, indoor plumbing is not that long ago, you know. Not that long ago, yeah. But you're, talking about, you're talking about bringing like Einstein or Newton here. Imagine bringing someone from 1842 to today. Yeah. Like what? I don't have to take a piss outside. Like, I mean, they would be what's flabbergasted. This, what's this thing? Uh, wash your hands? What you wash your hands for? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, they, they will be completely amazed by how we live this life. And they that would live like magic. Honestly, if, if we are serious about that the kings back in say 12th century uh their ration the, the 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 diversity of food options that they would have would not be similar to a low-paying wage oh, yeah. in the u.s today. go to any grocery store you got 10 different flavors of orange juice you want mangoes here you go you want some dragon fruit here you go if you bring this to a king that would be like a dish you know he would cherish it and share it with his queen or something they, they, they had a very small set of options mm -hmm. there the, we are all living the standard of life is so much higher than it was 200 years ago let alone 500 years ago so you know how tech i can't think of the term but like you know like tech 
has always been like, you know, two times two, four times four, like always doubles and doubles. Mm -hmm. You think Tiff will continue like double, double like this? I can't think of the term for what it is, but like Moore's Law? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I think that's um, going to continue to go on. Or do, is there an into that too? Moore's Law itself is probably going to reach the physical limit when we talk about electronics. Uh, however, there are photonics on the on the race right now. Photonics, would, I my bet they would replace all the electronics. It's the same idea, but instead of moving electrons across all of your devices, you move photons, which don't have a mass, and thus much more easily movable. Much they don't really heat up. There is no friction. They have lots of positive traits to that. So, in in a certain regards, Moore's law would be would continue, maybe just not in the shape of traditional electronic chips, but through the new tech. Through the generations, has science always been basically done, done the same way? And it has been in the same way. It's going to be a better way done. Isn't it time to find a better way to do science if it's been done the same way over and over again? General principle would be the same. Uh, hypothesis, experiment, data, updated hypothesis, experiment, data. General principle would be the same. The, um, the quality of tools that we use has definitely improved the the quality of and then you know you get a better you you utilize science to create some some kind of technology to create a better tool to better understand science so it's it's a um it's a virtuous cycle so a good example would be the hubble telescope yes to the james Webb telescope. yes okay. good example would be a microscope towards electronic microscope today yes yes you can actually go not so long ago, they actually were able to do an X-ray of a single atom that was unthinkable 40 years ago. So the methods, the, the, the tools are getting better every day. The core idea, um, the, the core philosophy has not changed, and I don't think it should change. It's, it's a great way of looking at the world in general. Like, uh, if you're rigorous about that, you can make any any part of your life better. If you apply it to, say, your sleep schedule and say, if I go to sleep at 9 p.m. every day, I wake up at 5, am I going to feel better? Let's run an experiment and do that for a month. And then let's run an experiment, go go to sleep at 10 and wake up at 6. What if I go to sleep at 10 and wake up at 5? So just do it for a couple of months and you'll figure out the best schedule for you. Just be rigorous about that and honest. And of course, you got to do like, can't be like one night, 9 p.m., next night, 10 p.m. You got to be like... You need to be rigorous. rigorous. You need to run an experiment. Otherwise, you can throw it away. So back, back to aliens real fast. This is my personal opinion. Like, I do think aliens out there, but a lot of people say, oh, I can't for aliens to come. Like, do we want aliens to come here, right? Like, do we want that? Like, if they can come all across the universe and come here, like, or do they have good intentions, not, no bad intentions, right? Like, do we want to take that risk, right? My only like fear is with that, you know? There were all the different theories on how to look at that. Uh, there was this book by, uh, one of the best, if not the best, Chinese science fiction called Three Body Problems. He advocates that any civilization, when they meet another civilization, uh, would like to wipe it out immediately, simply because of a potential explosive uh, growth of technology um, and inability to build trust between civilizations because of large distances. Uh, there is an inherent flaw in the book, so I, I would like not to discuss this book. People... People praise it, and I think it's a, actually it's a good written story, but the, the core concept, uh, he breaks his own core premises, and then the whole book, to me, reads like a, I don't know, five-year-old wrote a fiction book, like a draw a car. It's just, it's pointless, because the core principles are broken. Um, unlike Neuromancer, for example. Uh, the There are other people who say that no civilization can go past um, their own small habitat without actually outgrowing all these adolescent problems of killing each other and any civilization that we will meet that's outside of their um, scope of existence is actually by default um, good, is actually by default has good intentions. I do not think that it is the proper way to look at these things because if this civilization is if for example we are ants to them in terms of uh, like ants to you it's an ant at the end of the day you see everything this the life of this ant is this and that and his role is defined and you know exactly what it's going to do 
it's all predictable to you and it's tiny and it like there are billions of them. Do you really care? If we're ants to them, would there even be a dialogue? Would you go and talk to to an ant? Probably not. Yeah. I thought about that too. Like, you know, like the different levels, like the ants, the birds, the bees, and then us, and then something above us, you know. I always thought about that too, you know. Why why do we assume that we're pinnacle of intel intelligence or pinnacle of uh, creation? There is a book called a tiny, tiny book called, I believe, Fake Blindness or something like that. So it talks about uh, a human mission uh, meeting neurons. Well, not, not neurons. They're basically animals who have, who are, I believe, like 10 feet in diameter. I don't remember the, the actual thing, but like imagine 10 feet in diameter, that's all brain. And it has so many neurons, it can peek into your brain. And the idea is, you know that your eye is constantly moving. It's called saccades, I believe, S-A-C-C-A-D-E-S. -S -E Let me double check. Um, so your eyes is actually constantly moving. And um, yeah, it's a saccade. It's a quick, simultaneous movement of both eyes. And you or I don't perceive it, but our eyes are constantly moving and, and taking a snapshot of what's going on. And everything else is painted by your brain you do not necessarily see the bottle this bottle but it is you know it is there so you have a feeling it is there your brain paints that picture but your eye might be looking in this corner so these 10 feet brains they would be moving within saccades of a person okay. so they would never be visible so you had never had a chance to even see that thing it might be in this room we will never know it constantly moves uh, and it hides from our saccades um, moves between your movements uh -huh. of your eyes. That could be a possibility. Maybe the aliens are already here. Maybe they are already talking to some of our leaders. I just hope it's uh, Dalai Lama and not some crooked politician. Yeah, yeah. So um, you ever listen to Lex Friedman's podcast? I don't, no. So I listened to an episode one time talking about aliens and stuff. And Lex had a good point. He said, like, we, we're assuming they're going to come like in a human form, right? Why? Yeah, he said, what if they're like a water-based society and they come talk to the whales or dolphins or maybe like this, maybe just like this, like, you know, like this cloud of consciousness, right? Like we have no clue what they're going to be like, right? We just make assumptions based on movies and what we think they're going to be, you know, but we have no idea. What if it's not material at all? Yeah. What if it's pure energy and we will never know if they're in the same room, mm -hmm. sitting there having a laugh at our expense? <laughs> no, right. Yeah. I hope they do. They, they, then they're having fun. I mean, they could be doing observing us right now, do experiments, you know, like a, I mean, who knows? Yeah. So um, I think there are all these ways of, there are all these steps and stages of, of our mind. And I, for one, don't think that human being is the smartest one in the universe. I'm absolutely sure there are beings that are larger than us. Not in, in a physical sense that are smarter than us, that know it better than we do. All the all the mystical experiences of people of different religions and different faiths, they've all seen very similar pictures when they get mystery revelation. Mm -hmm. If you meditate deeply, you will see Buddha. And if you look at what Mandelbrot's fractal look like, you will see Buddha as well. It's... Um, there are shapes, there are specific things. Some people, it's called, um, the, the school of thought is called reductionist school of thought. They say that uh, all of your consciousness comes from the interaction of, interactions of neurons in your brain. And your, your consciousness is essentially a hallucination of your brain. And you tell yourself stories about what, what I am, who I am, Jason is this, Jason and that. And actually you're just a biological machine that's hallucinating. That's one school of thought. A uh, contrarian school of thought could be that, you know, there was great consciousness and it created uh, earth and, and sun in such a way that human life can be born. And it, it like everything is by design, by, by a super deity. And it wanted to have landing pad for its own consciousness into humans. And that's how it leaves itself, how it experiences itself. And you can get versions anywhere on this spectrum from complete hallucination to divine uh, movement uh, of soul and you can get anyone and of any flavor and source to talk about what consciousness is and is not and then you throw the multiverse on top of that 
you what? You and know, then you call the multiverse on top of that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and things become completely uh, convoluted. Yes, Rick and Morty is fantastic. Oh yeah, so I got this Rick and Morty tattoo right here. Oh, look at that! Yeah, is that a is this that episode when they're like yeah, like half a, half an hour adventure? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely one of the best ones. So, what was? Are there any scientists out there right now that are alive that you admire or look up to? Mike Levin, for sure. Uh, Mike Levin is the person who, in my opinion, predefining biologic uh, biology and our understanding of biological systems. He has a fantastic YouTube video on tardigrades. It blew my mind. Uh, it blew my mind to such a, such an extent that on some Saturday morning, I asked my wife to sit down and watch a 25-minute video about science on YouTube on like Saturday morning. She's like, can I get a coffee at least? I'm like, sure. But you, this is the first thing we're doing today. What he essentially did, he said that genetics, while it's important, is not the only thing that defines um, how we evolve and how our body grows. And uh, he did an experiment. He cut tardigrades in half. What usually happens if you cut tardigrade in half, then the head grows a tail and the tail grows a head, and now you have two tardigrades. That's normal. There is nothing you can expect. It's just awesome regeneration skills. What he did, he cut tardigrades in half and applied a specific type of electromagnetic field. He was able to grow a tail from a tail, so a tardigrade without a head. He was able to grow a head from a head, so a tardigrade without a tail. And he says that electromagnetic fields uh, really, I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, and anyone who is watching that, I advise them to go and watch the original content by Mike Levin. He has a TEDx video on YouTube. Um, but he essentially says that electromagnetic fields can be the guidelines of how we're going to grow any biological system, which kind of disproves the whole theory behind genetics to a great extent. Mike Levin is fantastic, yes. That's amazing. So next, let's move on to your deep tech VC fund. It is, it's sure. called RPV. Mm -hmm. So why the name RPV? Does it does that stand for anything or just random letters? or Not anymore. It used to stand for something, but then we found so many different ways to translate it and we like all of them. So okay. for me, I like research product value. Okay. To me, that's kind of the whole way of science from a mind, from a theory and a mind of a brilliant scientist all the way to a discarded package when the user used the product and done with that and got the value out of it. So, and we can talk about the whole idea of how I feel about science later, but answering to your question, I like research product value. My co-founder likes uh, radius, impulse, and degree of freedom because in our logo, the V is also a new, it's a Greek letter, new, uh, which stands for degree of freedom. And all you need to describe the physical system is radius, impulse, and freedom. That's a uh, degree of freedom. That's all you need to actually say where where a specific uh, specific mechanism, specific kind of system, how it's going to behave from now on into the future as well. And, you, and you're the founder of the organization? Yes. Okay. So there's something called um, International Scientific Advisory Board. What, what is that? How do they, how they help you? Those are the people that are focused on their specific scientific areas. And those are the people who help us with understanding if the science behind a specific startup is solid. So um, usually we, we only do things within physics, but within our advisory board, we have experts on photonics, on energy, on neuroscience, on all the different areas of how physics could be applied to make our lives better. So can a company be like, we'll say a radio company, right? making like we'll say they're making like glass bottles or something right mm -hmm. using a b2b SaaS model or i'm making stuff up, like sure. with the app whatever and they say man like i want to become deep tech a deep tech company can they then become a deep company of course they can't, can't, can't say it i'm deep tech but is there a way to go from a non-deep tech to a deep tech company i don't think so i think either you are or you aren't you are or you aren't D deep tech by definition means that you're doing something in science I would I would go with the strict um, measure and say something in science, not science or engineering, because that's a little too vague for me. You are doing something in the scientific realm that is that is a breakthrough of science itself, and you're you're building a breakthrough product on top of that. So if, if you are some SaaS fintech organization, there is no reason for you to go and try building a 
deep tech expertise. I would argue it's easier to build a logistic chain or warehouse and existing physical object. Deep tech requires a lot of R&D, a lot of scientific promise. And you invest like the, the early stage, correct? Pre-seed exclusively. Pre so with deep tech needing to be so advanced, how do you figure out who to invest in a pre-seed? I'm guessing that's an idea on that one almost. They really haven't proven anything at pre-seed, have they? Or not, have they not necessarily. Um, majority of the companies that we invest in would have some kind of prototype, at least in the lab environment. Sometimes even in the real environment. Um, so it's not a pure theory anymore. It's, I would say, TRL 3, 4, 5. Technology readiness level is a scale developed by NASA to define where the technology is in its development. Um, so I would say they have some kind of prototype and we can take it from uh, from that level of a prototype to an actual product and then help them with product market fit and getting it to the market. So, yeah. So D-Tech, that's different from... AI, machine learning, those are all different things, correct? Deep tech, I don't think it's a mature term enough. And probably like IT, it would never be mature enough. But lots of people would say AI, AI and machine learning is there. Lots of people say robotics and drones are there. I would argue that it's not deep tech enough, at least to our, in our understanding of what deep tech is. And how many people are on your team at your firm? Two two people full-time, two general partners, four venture partners, and roughly 20 advisors. Like, how do you find your deal flow? Because I also, well, I, I could be wrong. I guess there are not a lot of deep tech companies out there, are there? Or there's a lot of deep tech stuff out there? There is a lot of deep tech, deep tech stuff out there. There are accelerators, conferences. One of the largest is in France every year. Um, there are lots of VCs who come to us because they know we have scientific expertise and they would send things to us to verify and of course share the deal. Uh, we have partnership with CERN. We have partnership with Extreme Laser Infra Light Infrastructure. It's one of the laser largest laser providers in the world. Uh, we have lots of scientists who refer things to us and who bring interesting... I would say that scientists, al although they don't bring a lot, they bring the most interesting ones. Then they really understand the let me take a step to the side and explain why I think it's so interesting. Whenever a specific new technology emerges in the market, it usually has at least four or five competitive technologies that are trying to solve the same problem from a different angle. So when a scientist brings something to you, they usually bring the best in-class solution across all the different technologies. So at least one, one factor is definitely positive when it happens. So, um, this happens, we also have our own parser that goes through SBIR and STTR database. So we look through grants, what kind of companies receive grants of a specific phase, of a specific size for a specific application. Um, so all the traditional deal flow sources like VCs and conferences and awards and whatnot, accelerators, and some of our specific ones, such as scientific community and the parser. So why become a VC? Why, why go that route a couple years ago? The idea was when I, when I moved to the U.S., the idea was to be involved in science and technology deeply. And that was why I moved to the U.S. You asked why Seattle, because my wife selected why U.S., because I wanted to be close to science and tech. Whether it would be a VC firm or not, I had no idea. Uh, the more I researched the field, the more I found that there is one huge glaring problem with funding the scientific startups and deep tech startups. This is the mismatch of knowledge between entrepreneurs and investors. A lot of scientific entrepreneurs are not really great at sales, and that's okay. Nobody expects them to. A lot of investors, not only VCs, family offices, angels, a lot of investors are not able to ask all the right questions uh, when it comes to a scientifically intensive startup. So there is this mismatch in background knowledge which prevents a dialogue from happening. Uh, there is also, I would argue, a mismatch in values. So to scientists, all, all the VCs are doing some boring stuff, dealing with money. To VCs, all the scientists are sitting in ivory towers, thinking about some useless concepts. Uh, I'm, of course, oversimplifying and- uh, But some were, say, some were saying not about much. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're trying to change that. We're trying to make sure that VCs see the potential that scientists bring to the actual commercial world 
we're trying to explain to scientists and help them appreciate how much work is actually done by people who fund the future progression of their technology. In you invest on the United States or anywhere in the world? Anywhere in the world. So far, we have only done investments in the United States, but that's simply because the best deep tech companies are in the United States right now. What country would be second to the United States? Europe, 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 for sure. Okay. We have one deal pending and a couple of more that we're looking deeper into that. So talk about raising your, your fund. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of founders don't realize how hard it is for VCs to raise funds, right? I mean, because... As a, founder, founder, as a founder, we have a you know limited pool. Y'all have a really limited pool of money to go after, I would think. I wouldn't say it's a problem of a limited pool of money. Uh, I've raised dozens of millions of dollars as a founder and the CEO of companies. And when every single friend of mine told me that raising a VC fund is 10 times harder, I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> um, I was very wrong. It is indeed 10 times harder. Um the problem is less so the, the pool of money or actually a lot of money sources on the market. The problem is uh, the differentiation and opaqueness of this, this world of money. So when you go and raise for a SaaS, FinTech and e-commerce or whatever, you would have a couple of hundreds of VCs that do exactly what you do. You go to several of them, you make sure that you you do the pitch properly, you burn th through some of these VCs, you get your pitch locked in, in a couple of months, you're going to get done. And you always have this limited time. You say, okay, in three months, we're going to end up our closing. Whoever missed it, you missed it, done. It's easier to differentiate, easier to, to call it. And if you do FinTech for e-commerce, there may be another 10 companies like that, 20 companies like that. And 20 would be an extremely crowded space as is. There are 5,000 micro VCs in the U.S. alone. So funds that are 25 million or smaller, 5,000 of them, and all of them say the same stuff. We are going to invest in the fantastic startups and bring you a fantastic return. And we're for the founders. Uh, exactly. I mean, <laughs> to, to an average limited partner, the person who invests in a venture firm, LP, he hears all the same pitch, all the same stuff, all like, like, thousand times a year and it all looks the same it's very hard to differentiate uh, from the crowd it's very hard to be to stand out so they're looking for signals like oh you know i spent five years at Pandrana, or i spent 10 years at sequoia and i did this and i did that i did some angel investment angel investment does not necessarily convert into being a good vc is it better than nothing sure uh, is it really substantial no not really so it's very hard to differentiate for a venture fund and the world of investment is so much more opaque like there are family offices that would write million dollar checks and they don't have a website they don't have a linkedin page there is no way you will find them unless you're introduced and even if you're introduced they will think 15 times before taking a meeting with you i've had situations when i would be introduced to the same family office by three different people and they only reacted to the third person um, not because they didn't have respect from the, for the first two, it's just because they're like, okay, let's wait a little bit more. This guy is not prominent enough for even to, to, to take a meeting. And so those are the challenges. Very, very homogeneous product across all the different VCs and very unclear sources of money. What makes y'all say yes to a company? Wow, there is no one thing that will say make us say yes. There are like <laughs> forty reasons we're going to say no, but uh, there is not a single reason we're going to say yes to a company. Uh, the, our process is detailed. We go through deal breakers. There are twelve deal breakers when we start. If any of them is a uh, is is an actual fact, then we're not even going to entertain the deal deeper. There are roughly thirty five questions that will build the whole picture of the company later there is not a single one thing that will make me say yes unfortunately these 35 questions does the company know these questions ahead of time or is this something you do with your internal process that you ask yourself internally like these 35 questions and the company doesn't know where they're going through i i always paint a very clear picture to the company when we start so they usually know what we're going to ask uh they 
quite often they would actually uh, just get a list of questions from us in an email after a meeting or two, um, something that has not been answered before. And we're not as asking anything that they shouldn't already know. Uh, they should understand how they're going to defend their IP. They should understand how much money they need for the next couple of years. They should understand how they want to spend their money. They should understand for sure where they want to find themselves in a year from now, what milestones they're hitting. So we're not asking some obscure, unknown. You're not asking for question. the theory of dark matter times 27 or something. Exactly, like exactly. We don't ask that stuff because what's the point? Uh, we have our own international advisory board that would go deep into science, but we don't bother uh, the founders with all of these questions. As of in the past, company like we'll say like, you know, failed the first test, they came back maybe a year later and they were actually ready that year later, then you invested in them? I haven't seen that example yet. Not yet. Not yet. Are the companies that fail the test that you hope will come back with a better, better answers that you really want to invest in them, but well, they weren't ready? I think calling it a failed test is a little bit too harsh of a, of a way to put it because we are looking for a very specific profile of companies. I recently replied to one of the guys in neuroscience field and I verbatim told him, you are going to make a great company and it's probably going to print money like a crazy printer. It's just you do not bring anything in terms of science to the world. There is no deep science to back. So I'm very sorry, but we're we're going to pass on that. But by the way, here are three introductions to other venture firms who don't have that uh, as a di disqualifying factor. Um, I actually seen seen this scenario a couple of times before, and again, there will be other VCs who are happy to back them. Um, there are companies that I hope will come back to us, but it's not going to happen in a year or two. Uh, there is one company called HB11. Uh, the first people to figure out the proton boron 11 reaction for nuclear fusion. I love these guys. Um, Warren and uh, the whole team is fantastic. They need to figure out how to build a laser that's roughly 100 times more powerful than anything that exists today. No, no big deal. Yeah, just maybe yeah, know, 10 billion bucks. Or throw throw like. a couple of kindergartens on that problem. Exactly. Uh, you know, even the Nobel Prize winners don't have an answer to that question. So they will have to figure that out. And once they do, I'll be the first to back them. Probably by the moment they do, they will be a billion or billion dollar worth company, but uh, I'll be the first to back them. So you're, you're making investment decisions. It's like, this has to be unanimous. So it's like a three to two vote, two to one vote. How does that work? None of that. We have a scorecard and each question could be, each question is one to five and there's 35 questions. So every single member of uh, the committee makes their own individual assessment and then we just average out uh, okay. the, the opinion we do not have a discussion about that we do not try so to there's push no each subjective other. it's all like math so to speak it's all like i would say it's all completely subjective it's just not a single subjective opinion pushes anyone else subjective okay. opinion towards a specific and direction. how many people in the committee at any one time like five person four person or just depends? it depends okay. and at the smallest size the smallest size it would be four five and the smallest size would be five usually it's something like six or seven okay um one, one thing to to be very clear about it's always me and tomas and we go through the whole scorecard and other people usually would would have their opinion about specific area like ip protection or technological strategy or um, general business strategy so it's not necessarily that all all five people would answer every question. And some people would only answer two or three out of these 35. Okay. And so y'all have been a VC from like since 2021, I think you said? We've started thinking about that in 2021. We started raising in January 23, so just this year. Okay, so you're, I mean, pretty a brand new firm. Yeah, absolutely. And it seemed like, you know, a lot of deal flow, a lot of you know, stuff out there. How did you put yourself out there to attract all these potential deals? Air table. Okay. Airtable uh, is probably one of the best tools I've discovered in the last two years. Everything we, ru we run, we run on Airtable, whether it's our negotiations with limited partners mm -hmm. or it's our pipeline or it's our uh, media presence. So once we're done today, I'm going to go on and say, okay, production complete next next to your podcast. What's what's the best way of people reach out to you? Like, do you like cold emails, cold calls? E emails, okay. emails by far. I always respond to all the emails that I get. 
unless it's some really really dumb cult you something know? like i'm 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 selling bananas I invest my banana farm something like that pretty much yeah, yeah like like somebody who would start an email like hi no no name nothing i've seen that your firm is very active in private equity mergers and acquisitions i'm like delete like you did zero research or like hi i, I see you're human we both be there <laughs> like yeah like like do some effort if somebody says okay like hi arkady uh i see that you do deeply scientific stuff here is my biotech startup i'm like hey man thank you we don't do bio but thanks a lot here's a couple of other firms um but when people are just trying to do the email blast yeah like oh we're doing this blockchain i'm like we don't do software deals and then and the founder like two weeks later hey i'm i'm the founder of this blockchain i'm like i'm already responded to you my friend like once more and you're gonna go into spam yeah and um i i try to respond to all of the emails unless it's completely uh, unprepared completely cold yeah. email i know on the other end like they'll tell you like you always personalize your emails to different people but sometimes it's hard like you like you pull someone up you either want to sell to or like try to get invested in them and they have nothing anywhere no posts on linkedin you google the name there's nothing right so you're like because you don't have time to be like Colombo, like really deep dive with their background, right? Isn't it amazing though? Like, hey man, you're like a ninja. I couldn't find anything about you on the internet. I would love to learn more on how did you maintain such a low profile in our digital age? Yeah. Fantastic opener. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that is. Like you can always find something interesting to say about a, a specific person. Yeah. Well, when there is such an absence of information on the internet, isn't is it not that... This is a very interesting case. Yeah, I never thought about it like that. Yeah, it's a good point. You can always find a way to tailor that. And then one thing that I've learned about fundraising many years ago and then relearned it again here in VC, um, you really want to do your homework before you even reach out. There would be so many investors who would not be a good fit and you will waste your time finding them, getting into their schedule, having a call with them only to find out that they're not going to do your deal. Not because there is something wrong with you, but because they don't do blockchain. Yeah. Like, what's the whole point of doing that? So I would rather spend half an hour researching every yeah, single support. investor that, that I'm reaching out to. Then I spend two hours talking to them and hoping for something. Because most investors do a good fingers. job on the internet or somewhere. What they do or don't do, for the most part. Unless we're talking about family offices. Oh, yeah. Yeah, family offices are fantastically notorious about that. Like they don't say anything to anyone. But you found them though, right? Some kind of way. So I I, I don't do cold emails. Like I just don't do yeah. cold emails um, for many reasons. Um, so any anyone who is on my cap table, any investor who I have has came through a call or through a warm introduction, not through a cold email, and. Um, I would meet family offices when uh, some of our limited partners or some of our friends at VC community, they will just bring these people to me and uh, we'll have a conversation like like I had yesterday with, with one family office. Has there been a time in the, in the past when we were raising money and someone wanted to invest money in your fund, but you said, this isn't a good match for us, what we need? Yes, and, and said no good yes. Money? Not, not once, not twice. Okay. We have canceled a whole sleep of Russian investors in February 2022. Millions of dollars, more than 10 millions, almost 15. And we canceled every single one. Uh, but that is geopolitical. That's nobody's fault. We've canceled people who who are like, oh, I love your fund so much. I want to invest. And then I see that the person has no idea what he's talking about. And I'm like, how many, how many venture funds have you invested? And he's like, none. I'm like, okay. How many venture funds have you seen? He's like, yours is the only one. I'm like, man, go and look at least 20, 30 other firms. By the way, yeah. here are some good candidates for you. Talk to them and make sure that you know what you're getting in. You're locking your money for 10 to 12 years. Yeah. You have to trust these people. You have to be in good standing with these people. Just, just don't do things that are not, that you don't understand really well. I, I can't sell the couple of little piece like that. Um, yeah, so there have been situations. There have been people who I just don't don't like personally. There was this guy um, early in our fundraising experience. We even we were not actually even raising then. We we're just starting the pre marketing So talking to people, what would happen if we would raise this fund? Uh, if we were to create this fund, and the guy was talking to me. FTX happened. No, uh, that Sam Bankman Fried. Uh, yeah, that 
that guy. Um, and he calls me and he's like, so blockchain crashed means deep tech is going to crash. I'm like, what do you mean blockchain? He's like, FTX crashed. I'm like, that, that's not blockchain. <laughs> he's like, whatever, whatever. I'm like crypto crashed. So now deep tech is going to crash. I'm like, could you walk me through a logic, please? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. So crypto is a new thing. Deep tech is a new thing. One new thing crashed. Another new thing will crash. I'm like, so fantastic to figure out that this is your logic. So early in the process, please don't call me ever again. Like, like seriously? Like, that's like, comical. That's comical, yeah. So some people are comical, yeah. Man, that's, that's insane. So how do y'all decide how much money to raise for your fund? That depends on the strategy that you're you're running. A lot of you will hear a lot of people saying that your your size is your strategy. So there are, there is a specific amount of deals a team can do per year, especially a first time manager, especially emerging team, and there is a specific amount of time you have to deploy. So, for example, if you if you have three years to deploy, and you can at your best performance do ten deals a year, um, then that's it. That's your 30 deals. Then you say, I want to invest in, say, pre-seed stage. Pre-seed on average raises around a million bucks, just for the sake of example, on their round. Um, we want to put something like, let's say, 500K. Half of this round, we want to take the half of this round in these companies. So that gives you 15 million that you need to invest. You also need money to spend on your fund administration, your legal accounting, your management fees, blah, 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 blah. And you build up, you get to the amount, to the size of the fund that you need to follow your strategy. So it starts with the amount of the deals that you want to do and you can re realistically do. I cannot do 200 deals a year with my co-founder alone. It's, it's going to be insane. Um, so we target around 12 to 15 deals a year. We have four years deployment period. We target 50 deals total. That's how we arrived in 25. And then, so when, when doing these deals, is there like a certain time frame you want to make a decision? Like someone comes today mm -hmm. in your mind, okay, I want to make a decision in two months, three months, or it's not as linear as that? Roughly six to eight weeks. Okay. So pretty fast. I think that's pretty fast, isn't it? We, Especially like doing deep tech stuff, I would think. We back science and founder mostly. Science is what really takes time. Four to six weeks easily to make the scientific due diligence you really learn, you can only learn so much about the founder uh, before you start working with them and you learn majority of these things pretty early in the process. And do you prefer to invest like in a safe convertible note price round or? It doesn't really matter. Safe, okay. usually we see safe. Okay. Convertible note I haven't seen in a decade or so. Okay. I think it has been completely cannibalized by safe. Okay, so safes. What advice would you give a founder who's just like starting the fundraising process? Know your investors. Be very thorough in understanding your investors. Be very clear on who you want to approach. The ideal situation is you meet with 10 people and raise from every single one of them. It's like with dating, you know? The perfect dating scenario is you meet one girl and that's your wife. That's the perfect dating scenario. Uh, and dating is much harder than fundraising in a sense that you do not have a lot of information up front. You, when you fundraise, especially if you're a founder, you can go on the websites, you can look at LinkedIn, you can be very, very ready for, uh, for your fundraise. Nobody follows that advice. Everybody just spams every single VC they, they see in their vicinity and, you know, hope for the best. I think it's a waste of time. Go after the people who really are a good fit for you. So let's suppose someone's fundraising and a certain time span, maybe it's one month, three months, six months, but they've not raised what they want to raise. When should they stop reassess what they're doing and maybe start again later on? Maybe that's a good idea, yes. Maybe that's a good idea. Um, there could be two major reasons. There is a whole domain of smaller reasons, but Major reasons are the offering is not compelling. The idea is not good enough. The team is not good enough. Something is wrong with the offering. Uh, that could be the case. And in that case, definitely go back to the drawing board. Definitely go and rebuild your, your idea from scratch. The second option is that 
they didn't find the right investors or, or their process was off or my favorite minor problem is they don't follow up. Like I know founders with whom I said, okay, send me these materials. And they never did. And guess what? I never reminded them because like, what the hell? Like if they cannot share these materials with me, how are they going to run sales? How are they going to run recruitment? How are they going to be on top of things yeah, when they clearly yeah. are they, not? They can't follow up one time. How are you going to follow up with sales when there's a touch point in sales like at least 10, 15, maybe 20 times? That's insane. So um, mainly it's, usually, usually it is when the offering is not compelling enough and the, the idea is not compelling enough. Then go back to the drawing board. Often it is when you do not know the right VCs, you do not know the right investors, then go and find the right ones. Uh, and just be meticulous with your process. Don't be sloppy. And sometimes I think there's a, a, a lack of time in your part, right? You might have the perfect company for a certain VC firm, but they just spend all their dry powder and they have no money for you. If you are a perfect fit for this VC firm, they'll find the money for they'll you. Find the money for you. Okay. They'll find the way to run an SPV for you. Okay. E easiest thing in the world would be like, we found this fantastic company. We're between funds. We don't have any dry powder. What do we do? Let's go to all of our LPs and say, this is fantastic opportunity. Let's do an SPV for them. Okay. And they will find other investors who would invest in you. Uh, they will find ways to do it. If you're a perfect fit, everything else is just, you know, mechanical objectives. Mechanical. Okay. Are there any VC, VC, VC firms out there right now that you like want your company to be kind of be like a like... future ventures is fantastic. Okay. Uh, Steve Jervis and Mariana Sayanko, a lot of respect for them, their approach. They are marvelous. I, I would say they're they single handedly lifted deep tech to to the to the level where it is right now, at least in my perception. Uh, there are large firms like Lux Capital and the Engine from MIT, uh, which are also very, very strong, and I like them a lot. Um, there are other companies, uh, there are other VC firms with good brand names. Um, it just future ventures has a special place in my heart. I think you mentioned earlier, like going to deep tech conferences or any other any upcoming deep tech conferences you're going to go to, uh, there is the falling wall scientific conference in Europe in uh, beginning of November, really cool stuff. If you're interested in science and, um, there is a company called hello tomorrow. They have an upcoming summit in Asia, I believe in October. And then they have their global summit in Paris in March, March 21st to 23rd. If you're in deep tech, go place, for it. The place to be. The place to be. And then again, going to Paris in March. Come on. That's I mean, fantastic. Yeah. yeah that. So with all everything you have going on, how do you take care of yourself? I, I don't. <laughs> um, but but I think I could take better care of myself in terms of physical activity and sports, for sure. Uh, I could do more of that. I always sleep eight hours, no matter what. And majority of the days I wake up without an alarm clock. Um, it does mean that I go to sleep at like 9.30 p.m. every day. And uh, I've heard a lot of jokes about me being a grumpy old person already. Um, so ba basics are the basics. Get enough sleep every day. No matter what life throws at you, get enough sleep every day. You cannot work, no, like on average, an office worker works two and a half hours a day. That's an actual productive time. If you're a superstar performer, you can maybe work five to six hours a day. I mean, like diligent work. If you're only Elon Musk, maybe seven. If you're Howard Hughes, maybe seven and a half. But that's it. Everything else is just BS, complete and utter BS that people can work 10, 12 hours a day. I mean, they can be in the meetings for 12 hours a day. They can be in conversations 12 no, no, hours a day. They're not doing day. like deep thinking. They're not doing right. deep work. Yeah, deep work. They're not doing any deep work. No, 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 no. I mean, like, look, this is a fantastic conversation you and I have. Will I qualify it strongly as work? No, not at all. Would it help me in all of my goals? Yes. But is it like work? I don't think so. It's just a cool conversation yeah. to have with a nice person, but it's not like a work. It's not yeah. that I'm doing some deep due diligence or whatever. So, when people say I don't have enough time to sleep, it's it's usually bull crap. It's like you do, you don't have enough you don't have enough time to sleep, but you have enough time to watch Netflix yeah. or drink a bottle of beer yeah. or I don't know talk for two hours straight about how Lucy said that about Jennifer. You have enough time to sleep. So basics are the basics. Get enough sleep every day. Eat well. Don't eat 
bad shit. And by bad shit, I mean, don't eat added sugars. Try to minimize that in your life. Like if you want to eat sugars, go eat blackberry. It's a blackberry season. You go to Kirkland or Bellevue, it's free. You don't, you're not going to spend anything. Just, just walk on the street and collect, I don't know, two buckets of blackberries. Um, eat fruits instead of sweets, instead of, say, Snickers, go eat an apple. Try to minimize carb carbs in general and then to try to, to stay healthy in general. So get enough sleep. Make sure that you eat properly. You don't need to be on a very, like, you don't need to eat exquisite crabs and then to oysters to, to be healthy. That's unnecessary. Uh, you don't need to be vegan for that either. You can eat meat. Just make sure it's not some kind of... Uh, petty from a shop just buy a piece of meat and then cook yourself a piece of meat um or fish or chicken whatever works for you or eggs and exercise exercise at least half an hour a day do some some exercise not necessarily high intensity training but but at least medium intensity so i think that i'm not taking enough care of myself in, in the exercise department how do you do your schedule like on a daily basis? Like you work eight to five. You work, no, no. You work seven days a week. I I, I wake up at five thirty. My my let's go weekly schedule. I work Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah, those are my days. So Wednesday is off. Wednesday is off limits. I I don't do anything on Wednesdays. Uh, no work. Uh, no house chores. It's like it's my day, and everybody else can uh, can wait on the other side of the door. Um, Saturdays, I try not to work as well. Uh, I try to spend time with the family and usually Saturdays is when I, on Friday night, I would remove all of my digital devices. And until Sunday, I would not touch it. Computer, my phone, anything. So digital Shabbat, uh, so to speak. Um, this would be my weekly schedule. So Wednesdays and Saturdays are off. Sundays I spend on preparing for the week, documents, paperwork. And everything that doesn't require interaction with other pe people. That's why I don't spend time on that during the week at all. Usually paperwork can wait. Usually a week is nothing horrible, especially if you plan ahead. My usual business day would start at 5.30. By 6, 6.30, I'm done with my morning routines, meditation, shower, everything. By the way, taking care of yourself, meditation is a big thing. I completely forgot to mention it. Daily meditation. Doesn't matter if it's five minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, just do it daily and you'll see results in no time. Meditate. And then my, usually I would start from six. I work till, uh, till 11 o'clock. Then I spend an hour with my family, 11 to 12. And then I work from 12 till usually 5 p.m. So what it gives us, roughly 10 hours yeah. a day. And then from five till 9 p.m. I spend time with the family and okay. chill out. It's like that's how long you've like you that's been your schedule for like as long as you can remember is something new to you or since I moved here for sure. Okay. Since and I moved here. I'm guessing that's working pretty well for you. Yeah, it, it works really well, especially once once I've incorporated Wednesdays and now it's Wednesday and Saturday. I I don't feel like I, I'm working five days in a row. Um I feel like I work two days and I take a day off, work two days, take a day off. Yeah, for me somehow it's worked out where I work Saturdays and Sundays. But I take off like a half day Wednesday, half day Thursday. Okay. It's, it's, it works for me. Like one thing I realized, like if you take a day off during the week, you do like errands, right? Go to the dry cleaning, get your car fixed, get some gas, go, and there's really no one in line. Or mm -hmm. you go on a Saturday, like there's yeah. a big difference between going to Costco or Walmart at 10 in the morning on Wednesday versus exactly. 10 in the morning on Saturday. Exactly. You get it. And when, when it's a snowboarding season, there is nobody on the slopes on Wednesday. Oh, it's wow. so lovely. I didn't think about that. It's, it's the reason why I have. It's one of the main reasons why I started with Wednesdays, actually. Mm -hmm. I was like, why don't I take it off? And then it just became a, an ingrained part of my routine. And you'll be surprised. Nobody cares. Like, no. people would be telling me, like, oh, how, if I'm not online on Wednesday, who gives? Yeah, no one cares. No one cares. And, like, actually, people find it peculiar and interesting about you. Like, oh, you don't, you don't work on Wednesdays. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's cool. Why? And they, they get they get interested in that yeah. more than anything. Or you else. Think I have to be online. I might miss an email. But then if you do the math, you might make this up, might get 200 emails a day. At least 175 or like I want to say spam, but like a newsletter from someone you signed up for you're not going to read or something for this, you know, or Alaska Airlines has free flights for this, you know, <laughs> or maybe like 
few are actually like need to be exactly and 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 like and my thing if the email is a really emergency or email say if it's an emergency you gotta call me right yeah if it's an emergency they'll find a way to contact you in a different way you can always wait one day with any email and um yeah if it's an emergency people will find a way to contact you no matter what they will call your wife they will call your neighbor they will find a way to contact you yeah so as your firm grows and you hire more people coming on how how are you finding people to hire like what's, what's your process be for that we don't hire anyone yet we don't plan to hire anyone for fund one for fund two it's going to be probably I'm, I'm talking to multiple different people who can be principals in our next mm -hmm. firm in our next fund within the same firm i am I'm grooming some of them. I'm giving some of them different tasks, like let's write an investment memo together. Mm -hmm. uh, let's do this together. Let's do that together. And I see how they react, how they behave. And the ones who really are showing promise, uh, I will just hire them. And that's it. I mean, th this, um, we don't have to hire anybody urgently. I'm not going to hire anybody in this urgent manner. And there are lots of people who want to get into VC. It's it's a buyer's market. It's not a seller's market. It's a very cool and hype industry, which actually is not, there is nothing hype or cool about it. You deal with spreadsheets and meetings, 10 meetings a day. Lots of people, for some reason, think that the moment you start doing VCs, you are flying on the first ship to Mars. You're not. <laughs> You're not. No. Um... So you talk about your company some. Can you go like more detail how it got started? What you focus on now? What your big term version is? Very vision for this move forward. So the firm that that I have in my mind again, my my whole idea was that there is a broken broken piece in funding of science to, all the way through productization and to actually shipping to the customers. Right? You can get money on in the initial stages from universities and grants. You can get money in the late stages from VCs and banks. In the middle, there is no man's land. Majority of investors don't know how to invest in deep tech startups. They don't know what questions to ask. They are like, that's too complicated, pass. That's too difficult, pass. And they don't even try to understand it. And I get it. And I wouldn't be doing that. If I get a biotech company, I'm like, that's too difficult, pass. Because I don't understand biology. Nobody in my team understands biology well enough for us to back this synthetic bio versus that synthetic bio. And it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. The, what is wrong, in my opinion, is that there is such a limited pool of options for all the deep tech founders to to focus on that we're going to do it right now with physics only. In our next fund, it's going to be physics, biology, and neuroscience as three pillars. And in our fund number three, I think we're going to do the same exercise. And instead of just saying physics, it's going to be photonics, energy uh, generation, energy storage, energy transition. Instead of just biology, it's going to be genetics, synthetic biology, industrial biology, and so on and so forth. Instead of just neuroscience, it's going to be invasive, non-invasive, non-medical. So there will be different, we'll go deeper and deeper and deeper into each subfield. So instead of going from pre-seed to seed and series A and series B, we are going to distill the same pre-seed. It's just going to be more people focused on a very specific um, area. This is my vision. We're going to still do pre-seed, deeply scientific process, deeply scientific due diligence in just more fields, in more narrow fields. Are there any other VC firms doing anything like this or kind of close to it? There are some, but none of them are, none of them that I know of are as rigorous as we are in this scientific. The whole idea for us is to become the most scientific venture firm on the globe. Okay. So, has I have this question? So there's different levels of deep tech. Mm -hmm. Has someone is there a deep tech out there that you're waiting for someone to bring it to you that haven't yet? Like if they bring this deep tech, I'm gonna invest along of course everything in front, you know, kind of like maybe like someone who comes like, no, we're gonna figure out, you know, how to use dark matter to time travel, we're gonna figure out wormholes. Like is there some some like, exciting deep tech thing you're like, man. I want somebody to bring this to me so I can at least like do the due diligence and hopefully I, I'm still waiting for the fusion startup that we would okay. love. Okay. Fusion for sure. Okay. Let's let's get this figured out. Everything else will follow. Okay. All of the other big physical problems are gonna be limited by the amount of energy we can throw at it. So we need fusion to actually make this next leap.
And you have like a goal as a how many investments you do per year? 50. Oh, per year, 12 to 15. Okay. And for those 12 or 15, how many people you actually have to meet with? Like, I guess like, like 100 meetings for each investment or how's that work out usually? We need to look at every, uh, we need to look at around 100 to 150 companies to make an investment. We are only going to meet maybe 20 to 30 of them. So 20% of what we look at, we're going to meet. Uh, with maybe 2%, we're going to actually go into deep scientific due diligence and we're going to invest in roughly 1% of them. These meetings are like Zoom in person? Zoom, Zoom of course. Zoom Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Is there any like science out there where they, where they have to meet in person to show you like in person how it works? Or Zoom always good enough? Before I make a decision, I prefer to meet a founder in person. If need be, I'll fly out to them. I just It's less about technology because technology, especially science, t- technology you can see machine works um science you need to actually do some deep digging but for me personally it's more important about the founder i need to to feel the person see the person um you know have spent some time together better yet if we can spend a couple of hours together um, having a lunch walking doing something having philosophical discussions uh, about one of the big things that our first investment we had we went on a hike around the Buddhist monastery and uh, we've been talking about the consequences of the device that they bring to the world are are very, very large. I, I would argue that there is a potential to build the perfect junkie device and there is a potential to build the perfect torture device out of what they do. They They are able to affect the brain in a very specific brain region and you can select which brain region. That's scary. That's scary. And you can create something that is that heals depression or an anxiety disorder on a, on a good side. On the dark side, you can create a perfect torture device. And let's light up all the pain centers in the one person's brain. It's, even, it's impossible to do it with your nerves. It's impossible to, uh, I don't know, it's impossible to make you feel that level of pain without damaging your body for, for hours and hours on one take. So it's a perfect torture device. And I was like, how are you going to live with the consequences of bringing this to the world? I'm not asking you about how you're going to protect your IP. I'm not asking you about how you're going to make sure that your company doesn't do shady stuff like that. I'm asking how are you, like your company is successful, IPO, 30 years past, you're on your deathbed. And you know that your company has been taken by unsavory agents and used as something malicious. How do you live with yourself? Those are the kind of questions I want to understand before I invest. Yeah, that's a deep question. Hopefully you have the right answer. Well, there is no right answer to this question, I think. Uh, there was a whole movie, Oppenheimer, about this. Yeah. There is no good have answer. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. It's Beautiful a, movie. I, I need to go see it then. Beautiful movie. Beautiful story of a scientist. You don't have to go to a movie theater to watch it, though. Yeah. It's not traditional Nolan when you're overwhelmed with visuals and sounds. <laughs> it's 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 an actor's movie. Okay. A character movie. All right. So... For you, for your VC firm, how do you how do you plan to grow it? You know, you have a goal like a mile, like no get. If you plan to go from twelve to fifty investments this year, like twenty to twenty five next year. No, we we're going to stick to twelve to fifteen investments for this fund. We're not going to expand the this fund's investment. There is no need to do that. Uh, we're going to grow it later on when we raise fund two. We essentially want to raise three times the size of this one, and do as I said physics, biology, and neuroscience as very clear strategies and still do the same 50 investments in each of them, put 25 million in each of these directions and make 50 investments in each of these. And what's your average investment? Oh, yeah, uh, 200K, okay. something like that. Okay. Um, I think what else? So so you say you want to be like the most, um, what's the word you use, like most due diligence? Most Scientifically savvy. Scientifically savvy. How do you do that? Like, how do you prove to other people that you're like the most scientific savvy? We we go all in when it comes to scientific due diligence. We get other, not only me and my co-founder, not only our international advisory board, but also the actual experts in every specific field and subfield. If we need a specific type of numerical modeling that is used in material science, we'll find the person who wrote 15 papers on numerical modeling and material science. We know how to discover the scientists. We know how to motivate them. We know how to get them interested in working with us. And uh, thankfully, when it comes to science, it's like with chess. 
uh, if you achieve checkmate, you achieve checkmate. Yeah. With the science is the same. If you have achieved really rigorous analysis of that and nobody can disprove it, there is nothing left to prove. That's it. We've done it. Nobody else can get the same. Maybe maybe some other people can get the same level of rigor, but you cannot be better than that. There is a very clear ceiling to hit. How do scientists convince other scientists to peer review their work? A mix of ego and monetary motivation. Okay. Some 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 scientists uh, would be simply driven by the fact that they think that this is not the best approach, and they're going. I'm going to disprove that approach. Let me show you how. What's the better way to do it? Other scientists would be more motivated with a with a, an immediate cash gain, and anything in between of these things. Some people just like us, and they they give us due diligence for free. And uh, they just like what we do and they feel connected to the mission. That's also a dimension that uh, we sometimes rely on. So the founder, like both the founders are trying to get investment from you. Does the school that come from matter at all? Like is a, is a, like a founder has a background in something from Harvard, a better fit than someone like a founder from, I like will say like New Mexico Institute or junior college or science, science, regardless of the background. The school is. itself is not as important as the amount of publications and uh, the, the depth of knowledge of that person in the field. There are fantastic people who come from the proverbial New Mexico. There are some really bad people who come from proverbial Harvard. Um, I would argue what really matters is the last five years of their job and what they've published on this specific topic. We're looking for a team which has at least one scientist and at least one entrepreneur. The, these are usually the best teams for us to invest in. We would shy away from a team that has no scientific founder. We would probably shy away from the team that has no entrepreneurial ambition either. So it's just pure scientists. Okay, go, go ahead, find your grant funding or whatnot. <laughs> you don't want to build a business out of that. You want to continue your research, do that. Nothing wrong with that. Fully supported, just not an hour dime. Okay. So is there anything I should ask you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? No, I don't think so. I I mean, we, you and I can have some, some discussions uh, about the, the nature of uh, um, politics and military, but I, I, I would not want this to be as a thing that we broadcast. Yeah. Um, can you give us your social media so people can reach out to you? Uh, sure, LinkedIn is the best way. Just look for me, Arkady Kulik, A-R-K-A-D-Y-K-U-L-I-K. -K -K. I'm happy to to answer to your connection request. And then um, before we get out of here, can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Be the best version of yourself. Be the richest trick. Freddy, thank you for your time, Dave. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me. And to the listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.